Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, the organizers for putting together this very nice workshop and uh, for giving me the chance uh, to present uh, results uh, from Tilman Faust Group from the University of Stuttgart here um, on this conference. And uh, so, so I'm going to talk about uh, also about uh, Rydberg molecules. Um, and I would like to convince you in this talk, I mean, we, we've seen um, all these uh, difficult potentials for these Rydberg molecules. But in this talk, I will address the question what happens when you add also the spin degrees uh, of freedom of, of the constituents that make up these molecules and try to convince you that one can use them actually uh, to um, couple into states that are typically difficult to access via uh, normal uh, photo association schemes. And in particular, I will talk about experiments where we photo associated uh, these trilobite Rydberg molecules, which have this peculiar um, shape of the electron density and which are, um, with standard method, methods, are typically difficult uh, to photo-associate because they have this high L uh, angular momentum character. But what we use uh, in this experiment is the, the coupling uh, between the nuclear spin of the ground set atom and the orbital degrees of freedom of the Rydberg electron to actually kind of uh, um, find the coupling into these, uh, these um, uh, molecular states. So the talk will be... Um, separated in, uh, in uh, three parts. As in the first part, I will talk about this photo association of these trial by drip of molecules and how we make it possible with this coupling between the spin degrees of freedom. And then in the, uh, in the um, second part of the talk, uh, I will hold this a little bit brief because Jesus has also mentioned some of these uh, things. Uh, I will talk about spectroscopy of a single Rydberg impurity uh, in a BEC and in particular, like to give you an overview or an outlook what we uh, what we want to make like how we want to use this to make a tool out of it uh, and actually use uh, the, the coupling of the single ripper impurity to the BEC to actually um, uh, kind of devise a method to uh, to um, image the wave function of the ripper uh, electron. But let me start with the first part uh, of this. Uh, this outline of the, the photo association of these Rydberg trilobite, uh, trilobite Rydberg molecules, and uh, for this I will give like a brief overview over over uh, the, the different kinds of, of molecules that you can have to kind of get an idea of what what you can add when you then add the spin degrees of freedom as well. Yeah? So some of these things will be kind of overlapping with what Jesus told us already, but I think it's it's good to have like a bit the, the picture. Okay, so the the system that we uh, that we study in the lab is typically a single uh, river atom uh, inside an ultra cold uh, cloud, yeah? and uh, these experiments are now done in a situation where the cloud, where the, the ultra cold cloud is uh, um, not too dense, yeah? so that you have typically uh, one ground state atom sitting within the river orbit. Yeah? So the system we are uh, we are considering is is the river atom made of made of the ionic core and the Rydberg electron and a ground set atom that sits within the orbit of, uh, of the Rydberg atom. And uh, uh, this kind of system can, as we have learned already or seen already a couple of times, uh, can give rise uh, to a new type of, of chemical bond, uh, an ultra-long-range Rydberg molecule, and this molecule um, appears due to the interaction of the, of the Rydberg electron with the ground set atom. Uh, so this happens uh, with a one over R4 um, polarization potential and can be uh, nicely or can be uh, adequately um, explained using a Fermi contact potential um, or just a delta potential yeah, um, uh, with a strength that is given by the, uh, by the S-wave scattering length uh, between uh, the electron and, uh, and the ground set uh, for the electron ground set scattering. And what we typically include then in this, this uh, um, first uh, simple potential is that this scattering length becomes energy dependent uh, because the closer the electron comes to the core, the more kinetic energy it picks up. So you have to make this, uh, you have to include that this that the scattering length is essentially uh, energy dependent. Um, so when you do this, then uh, um, you can uh, kind of uh, approximate uh, what kind of um, potentials you would expect for this molecule. Yeah, so kind of an Oppenheimer potential, and if you do this for isolated Rydberg states, which are well um, isolated from, from, from other states by their quantum defect, for example an S state, uh, then to first approximation you can just uh, derive the Born Oppenheimer potential by using this Fermi contact potential and um, 
uh, evaluating its expectation value, kind of averaging over the, uh, the electron density. And then you get a born oppenheimer potential, which is as a prefactor that is given by this k-dependent scattering length, and is essentially proportional to the square uh, of the Rydberg electron wave function. So for an S-type uh, Rydberg uh, molecule, uh, you, have, you have this uh, spherically symmetric Rydberg wave function uh, with uh, the radially oscillating structure, and it's a bit hard to see on the slide, I apologize for this, yeah, but you see that the potential here essentially follows, so that's the born oppenheimer potential for these molecules, it's, it's, it essentially follows the Rydberg uh, electron density. And in uh, this potential, you can have then uh, bound molecular states, for example, the vibration of ground state or also vibration of excited states. And these, these are the kind of simplest type of these Rydberg molecules that you can create. Um, for, and and uh, how, how do you do this in the lab? Well, what we have is an, an ultra-cold uh, rubidium cloud um, that for these type of experiments we typically prepare at a few uh, microcalvin temperature uh, held in a magnetic uh, quick trap. So it has this, uh, this elongated um, cigar-shaped form. And then we use a two-photon transition uh, to couple from uh, the rubidium uh, ground state via uh, the 6p3 half intermediate state into high-line ripper states. Uh, so this two-photon transition is made up of a blue photon at 420 nanometers and um, a laser at 1020 nanometers, which we can widely tune to address uh, uh, um, different ripper states. Uh, um, I would like to mention that in, in our setup we have uh, actually the, one of those lasers uh, highly focused into the BEC or into the ultra cold cloud and this allows us to actually pr produce this Rydberg impurity uh, kind of spatially abreast. And so it, it have, we have a really good spatial resolution which, where we can uh, kind of nail down where we create this impurity. Okay, and if, you, if we then do spectroscopy of this system, uh, then what, what we can, uh, what we can uh, um, and our signals actually be, I mean, we ionize the Rydberg um, atom that we create, and then we just count the, the number of ions on the Rydberg atom, uh, an ion detector, and then we see such type of, uh, of spectra typically. Yeah? So you have, uh, you have the bare uh, Rydberg transition, but then when you go ready tuned uh, from, from the bare Rydberg line, you see additional resonances popping up, and these resonances uh, can be then attributed to these uh, ultra long range. Uh, Rydberg molecules that for, for this particular data set would correspond to the vibrational levels that sit, uh, that sit in this uh, uh, 62 uh, S potential. And uh, what you can also have is not only dimer states, but you can have uh, also trimer or quadrimer or pentamer states uh, uh, where multiple atoms actually uh, are bind, bound to the, uh, to the Rydberg um, atom. Okay, so this is uh, uh, kind of the, the simplest uh, uh, picture, yeah, but now um, uh, when you leave uh, these, um, uh, these isolated Rydberg states like S states, D states, or P states and go into the high L uh, hydrogenic manifold, then uh, a new uh, class of these Rydberg molecules, as we've already heard, kind of emerges. Uh, and those are the so called triobite molecules. Yeah? And they come about now because this, this Fermi uh, contact potential had, like, the strength of it is essentially strong enough to really strongly couple different L states. And due to this strong coupling between the different L states, strong mixing, you actually get a, a new born Oppenheimer a potential energy curve that is deeply bound uh, and where you can have also um, an, a vibration of um, molecular states, uh, which, which are these tripod states. And, and the typical electron density uh, uh, resembles these ancient st uh, structures of a trilobite, if you wish. Uh, with, a, with an electron density that is highly peaked at the turbo atom, yeah, and this gives them uh, an extremely large electric dipole moment, which would make them interesting. Yeah. So typically, the dipole moments of these guys uh, reach hundreds to thousands of divide. Yeah. And uh, I will show you later, la later that these trilobite molecules that we produce now um, uh, has, has really dark, has like large dipole moments of several hundred divide. Okay, but so then this is just to compare, yeah, so the normal S-type molecule would sit on a completely different energy scale here. It's just a few megahertz bound, whereas the trilobite states are bound here on the gigahertz scale. Okay, but um, uh, just to, to complete uh, this kind of picture, yeah, and there, if you add now also P-wave scattering into this uh, electron neutral scattering, then you get a, a new, another new type of molecules, these butterfly molecules, uh, which comes from a P-wave shape resonance. 
uh, here in rubidium, yeah, uh, which uh, rate, uh, the molecular potential actually um, ranges over the S, D, and P states. Yeah, and down here, uh, you can actually then excite into these butterfly states. And they have just recently been observed, as we heard uh, in Harry Potts group, uh, uh, using actually a one photon trans uh, transition into this P state. So, and, and this is uh, kind of uh, the motivation also, these, these uh, butterfly molecules, because they, they are here close to the P state and coupled to the P state, you can excite them by one, one photon transitions. Yeah? The S, D, and P states, or the S and D states, you can excite by a two photon transition, but these uh, these trilobite states are in general difficult to laser associate yeah, because they, they have a strong high out character um, and, uh, and that makes photo association uh, uh, difficult generally. Yeah. But uh, we would like to employ now the, uh, the spin degrees of freedom of the, of the ground state electron, meaning the, in particularly the nuclear spin of the ground state, um, um, to kind of um, uh, find a way to couple into these states. Yeah. And the, the trick is somehow that you um, kind of you, you try to bridge, so to say, the energy gap between the S states and the trilobite states by the hyperfine coupling of the bond state. Yeah? So this is typically in the let's say in the gigahertz regime, yeah? and then you can find uh, um, a parameters regime yeah? where where this gap kind of uh, matches to the with the hyperfine uh, splitting of the rubidium bond state, which is 6.8 gigahertz. But uh, for, for this, we have to add now to I mean, these potential curves have now have been shown only for, for triplet scattering between the electron and, and the ripple electron and the ground state atom. Yeah? So the spin, the electron spin and the ground state electron spin work line parallelly, and this gives rise to a triplet scattering process, and we have only included the scattering length for this triplet scattering. Yeah? Um, if we want to Play now with these spin degrees of freedom. We have to add the singlet scattering term as well. And how can we do this in the in the lab? Well, we could just by during our laser association or laser uh, pulse, as we, we choose the polarizations, actually in a way that we flip uh, the electron spin during excitation. And so we would have uh, not only uh, the scattering between uh, the ground state having spin up and the Rydberg having spin up, but also the channel where the ground state is spin up and the Rydberg is spin down just by choosing the polarizations in, in the right way. Um, and th this is kind of the state that we could assess in, assess in the lab by tuning with uh, the polarization cell. And uh, this gives rise then to the fact that you can, by, by choosing uh, or by trying to couple to this state, uh, you can actually um, access both scattering channels, the triplet scattering channel and the singlet scattering channel. And this is just to illustrate this, so you can certainly just expand this. Uh, this state into a triplet part and a singlet part. Yeah? So that, that's just to, to show you that it becomes now important to add triplet and singlet scattering contributions. Yeah? Um, so th this is, would be kind of the extension of the model that we need to, uh, to, ex to explain what we try to do in the lab. Yeah? And um, then it also becomes clear now that when you play with the electron of the ground set atom, I mean, this is coupled to the nuclear spin as well by the hyperfine coupling. So if you want to uh, explain this whole system now with, it, with all its internal spin degrees of freedom, then you have to also include the ground state hyperfine interaction. Yeah? So this would be kind of the full model uh, to, to capture all the, all the spin degrees of freedom. And one can kind of illustrate this uh, in the following plot. Yeah? So what we have is the Rydberg atom uh, with its um, orbital angular momentum and its spin, um, uh, electron spin, they are coupled by the fine structure um, of the Rydberg. Then you have this, the perturber atom in its electronic ground state uh, with uh, the electron spin and uh, the nuclear spin. They are coupled by the hyperfine interaction. And then the electron uh, scattering, triplet and singlet scattering channels would actually couple uh, the Rydberg electron spin with the uh, ground state electron spin. Yeah? And this kind of uh, um, diagram shows you that uh, in, in this way you can kind of indirectly couple the nuclear spin of the, of the ground state atom with the orbital angular momentum of the Rydberg uh, um, electron. Yeah? Um, okay, so uh, that's just to, to sum this up. So the Hamiltonian that we have now to uh, um, to calculate the Born-Oppenheimer potentials for including all these spin degrees of freedom would be 
the bare rubric atom, including its fine structure, uh, the singlet and triplet S-wave scattering, yeah, which is just the Fermi, uh, the normal Fermi pseudo potential, uh, then the singlet and triplet P-wave scattering, and finally the hyperfine interaction uh, of uh, of the ground state. Okay, if we add all this up, uh, plus uh, we also have to add uh, the interaction with external electric and magnetic fields. That's more or less a experimental complication because in our setup there's always a magnetic field present. So to understand the spectrum in the end, we have to add this. That's more or less the detail. <coughs> okay, but if we if we do all that, then we can now calculate these von Oppenheimer curves uh, with all the spin degrees of freedom actually plugged in. Um, okay, and now we have to make this coupling uh, between uh, this uh, angular momentum of the Rydberg electron and the nuclear spin somehow resonant. Yeah, that's what I meant before when I said, okay, we have to bridge somehow this gap between the S state and the, uh, and the trilobite state. And uh, we do this by choosing the principal quantum number just in a way that this gap here uh, matches the hyperfine uh, interaction of the rubidium brown state. And uh, for rubidium, this happens at around n equals 50. And then you get such type of a picture. Uh, now you see that uh, at this principal quantum number, you get actually an, uh, the 50 s state with the ground state atom being in the upper hyperfine spin, f equals 2. For rubidium, it's f equals 2. Uh, this 50 s state in f equals 2 is essentially degenerate um, or crosses the trilobite potential that comes from the 46 hydrogenic manifold with the ground state atom being in f equals 1. So in the, in, the, in the lower hyperfine state uh, of, the, of the ground state, rubidium ground state. And then there is 6.8 gigahertz detuned, and uh, there's the uh, 47 hydrogenic manifold with uh, the ground state in F. But just by choosing n right, we get now into this situation that, uh, that we get this crossing between uh, an S state uh, and, uh, and the trilobite state. And, um, uh, if you have now, if you go now to kind of zoom in and have a closer look on this crossing, then you will see that uh, this is actually an avoided crossing. Yeah? And the reason is because you have this coupling between the nuclear uh, spin and, and the uh, uh, angular spin, so the, the angular momentum of the uh, um, of the uh, electron. Yeah? So this couples uh, the trilobite curve to the S uh, state and. And this is how this coupling looks like. Yeah, so here's the 50s uh, molecular line with f equals 2, yeah, that would be as you told here. Uh, it just goes, uh, goes through and it actually uh, crosses with the trilobite state, which is very steep here, so it comes from the top. Yeah? Um, and, th and now, because of this coupling, you form an avoided crossing. Yeah? So there's a splitting between the trilobite state, which goes down, and the S state. Yeah? So it's a hybridization, actually, of the of the trilobite with the S state molecules. And if you plot the, uh, the electron wave function now along this born Oppenheimer potential for different internuclear distances, then you can actually see this hybridization also in the, in the electron density. So, so out here you have essentially an S-type molecule. If you go further in and you come from the trilobite curve here, you get the characteristic electron shape of an electron density of a trilobite state. And if you're somewhere here in these wiggles, yeah, then you have a hybrid of an S-type state, uh, that, that's this guy, yeah? so you have a hybrid of an S-type state and some trilobite state. And, uh, both objects in one molecule. Yeah? And this is now what we can use, uh, because we have an, an finite S, or we have an S character and some trilobite character, so we can use the S character now to couple into this state with a simple two-fold excitation speed. Okay, and, uh, and when we do this now in the lab, as I said, we have to add the, uh, uh, the external magnetic field to understand our spectra. That makes things a little more complicated. Yeah? So uh, then actually the, the simple S molecule split, splits up in, uh, five, in nine different uh, uh, curves, uh, which are the, just the, the Zeeman the uh, states, uh, the, the magnetic Zeeman states, uh, which are split now in a magnetic field, but kind of luckily, with our polarizations, it turns out we can couple to only three of them. And considering three of them is enough to explain our experimental data. Um, and uh, in, in these uh, von Oppenheimer curves, we can now calculate the um, vibrational uh, um, molecular states. Huh? 
And uh, uh, so this, this blue one would actually be the simple uh, uh, S-type molecule, yeah? but I would like to uh, focus now on these guys here, which actually happen at, at blue detuning with respect to the bare Rydberg line, yeah? which is rare for these Rydberg molecules, where it's typically always at red detuning, yeah? but due to this coupling, you, you find our states at blue detuning. Um, and uh, um, those are of this uh, hybrid S and trilobite character, and those we uh, should be able to those we should be able to laser associate in this program. And that's how the, the spectrum now looks like. Now finally comes uh, some data. <laughs> and so we have uh, um, the bare Rydberg line at zero detuning, um, the Rydberg line with the spin uh, flipped, yeah? so, so the, with the electron spin uh, um, uh, pointing down, uh, um, just uh, uh, separated by the Siemens splitting in the presence of the magnetic field. Then we have lines at red detuning here and here, which we can attribute to, um, uh, to, the, um, uh, to the bound states uh, in these potentials, yeah, but I would like to focus now on this uh, hump here, yeah, because this happens at blue detuning, and this we can attribute to, uh, to uh, the states that, uh, that live in this uh, von Oppenheim potential here, which is of this hybrid tripod and S-type character. And then we can compare calculated binding energies with what with uh, the, the energy that we find in the experiment and we can associate, uh, we can then um, uh, compare and see that we have nice overlap actually with this, uh, with this state here. Yeah. So this matches the binding energy, but to really be sure that this is now, th this state has some trilobite character one wants to measure its, its dipole moment. Uh, that would be the ultimate signature. I mean, only, only having a spectroscopic signal well, you have to be very sure that you get everything right there. Yeah. But what we did is we measured the, the dipole moment of this state now by, uh, um, by um, observing its behavior in an in, in, uh, external electric field. And that's what you see. So uh, in this color plot, you see uh, laser detuning. This is the bayer rydberg line. Uh, here at blue detuning, we have this, uh, this uh, um, trilobite state. Yeah. And if we apply now an electric field, then we see that this uh, state strongly shifts. And just look at the numbers. So you, you just need a few millivolt per centimeter, which is really tiny fields, uh, to shift this state, state here by a few megahertz. And from the, from the shift, you can deduce a dipole moment, uh, which is around 135 dBi. And this also matches the calculated uh, dipole moment that we get from these uh, of uh, calculations. And so this, this matches quite nicely. And uh, it's a, it's a, this is really tiny field, so it's really amazing that you can uh, have these huge dipole moments and so. Okay, so um, then with the last slide uh, on this topic, I would like to uh, um, stress again a little bit that with choosing this the principal quantum number in the right way, you can really make this coupling between the trilobite and the S states on how resonant. Yeah? Um, so this is this was the data for 50s, yeah? and there you get this nice hybridization of the trilobite potential with the S-type potential. Uh, if you go just one principal quantum number down to 49s, then this coupling vanishes yeah? because the trilobite state, which actually sits somewhere up here, yeah? and these are basically the S, pretty much the S molecular states, yeah? with uh, some effect of this coupling on the depths here of the potential, but th there there is no. Uh, no direct crossing of the two states. Yeah? Um, this also matches relatively nicely with what we see in the experiment. Uh, in particular, this fluidy tune state here completely vanishes, so it's, it's gone. And if you go higher in principal quantum number to 51s, then the trilobite state actually crosses out here uh, at, at much larger internuclear distance and would kind of bend up, bend somewhere here. Yeah? Uh, so this makes uh, uh, some of the states uh, at red tune actually uh, vanishing, yeah? so they, they kind of, they're not, not uh, uh, present uh, for this principal quantum number. So this kind of shows that you really have to pick the, the principal quantum number right to make this coupling between the nuclear spin and the angular momentum of the river electron resonant uh, and, and open up this avoid crossing and create this hybridization. Okay, um, with this I would like to come uh, quickly, uh, how much time? Uh, maybe 10 minutes or so? Yeah. Six plus. Six plus. Yeah. So uh, now I would like to come a little bit to uh, experiments that we did uh, in with Rydberg impurity, not in an ultra cold cloud, a few microkelvin temperature, but in a BEC. 
And in particular, I would like to focus on what we want to do with it. Yeah. So first of all, what happens if you increase now the density? Yeah? So these experiments that I've shown you are all done in a pretty, like in, in a non-too dense environment, so that you have typically one or maybe sometimes two perturbers within the ripple orbit, but not more. Yeah? And then you get this kind of uh, spectra uh, with these discrete uh, resonances that you can attribute to these molecular bound states. Uh, if you increase now the density of the ground state sample by condensing it and going to a BC, then you get spectra that typically look like this. Huh? Um, so this is for a 62S state, huh? and uh, when you check how many atoms you have within your ripple orbit, then in a BC with our typical densities, we have typically a few thousand ground state atoms that sit within the ripple orbit. And then instead of seeing discrete resonances, we essentially see that the spectrum just becomes broad and we have kind of a, a continuum uh, at, uh, ranging over, over many tens of megahertz. Uh, so we get kind of a density shift um, on, on the rubric uh, excitation spectrum from these many ground set atoms in the BC. Um, yeah, so that, that's this, uh, this hump here. Uh, you get a continuous uh, spectrum which you can attribute to a density shift. And if you have a little bit of um, a closer look uh, on, on how this transforms to the principal quantum number, that's pretty nicely shown in this plot. Yeah? So if you start with 50s, uh, 40s, yeah, then you still see uh, the molecular bound states uh, appearing, which here are a few tens of megahertz uh, um, um, binding energy. And, but you can see already that uh, below these bound states, you have kind of this continuous spectrum that comes from this dense region in the BEC. If you increase principal quantum number, then the binding energy of these discrete uh, resonances actually becomes smaller and smaller. Yeah? For 90s, they are just only a few I think, tens of kilohertz or so. Yeah? But the main part of the spectrum is then really dominated by this density shift. Yeah? And, and interestingly, this, so, so you have some asymmetric broadening of this, uh, of this spectrum. Yeah? You uh, um, have a change in the, in the um, line shape a little bit, yeah? but interestingly there is no prominent scaling with n or n squared. Yeah? And this is due to the fact that when you go higher in n, um, the uh, potential depth of these Rydberg uh, or number potentials becomes smaller and smaller and they scale just in, a, in the same manner as the Rydberg orbit increases. Yeah? And for this reason you have essentially always the same kind of shift for a homogeneous density which does not depend on n. So it's, that, that means that the, the detuning from resonance gives you actually, um, is, can, you can attribute this in the simplest approximation directly to the density uh, that you probe, uh, the, the, the density region that you probe in the DC. Yeah? And uh, this you can understand from the simplest version of this uh, uh, Fermi contact potential with just a not even energy dependent scattering length that you would just average now over. Um, homogeneous density of many atoms that sit within the ripple orbit, then you would just expect a shift that only depends on the density. Yeah? And if we calculate this shift for our typical densities that we have in the BEC, uh, then we would end up somewhere here, around 50 megahertz. Yeah? And now you see already there's that that's the peak density of our BEC. Yeah? And then you see that there's uh, there's actually a signal that is even further uh, reticuned. So when, to, to uh, understand this, Jesus has mentioned it already, we have to take into account now, to really model this spectrum in, in the correct way, we have to take into account the P-wave shape resonance in the video. Um, and we have done this in the semi, kind of semi-classical uh, way by assuming that the atoms that make up our BC are kind of point-like particles that we would just uh, distribute over the Born-Oppenheimer potential of this huge Rydberg um, atom um, and uh, um, distribute them in a way that this distribution resembles our typical uh, distribution of the atoms in the BC, which are typical density. And if you do this, uh, you can do this for just uh, calculating these von Oppenheimer curves with, with only S wave scattering, or you can uh, add P wave scattering, and then you see in the red curve that here you have this P wave uh, shape resonance that modifies the potential for, uh, for the uh, for video uh, at around 1,200 already here for uh, 40s. Yeah? Um, you see that uh, this can strongly modify this density shift that you uh, expect in the uh, experiment. And indeed, when you when you compare to our experimental data, we see that it makes uh, some some effect. And that uh, when you add the P wave shape resonance in this type of semi-classical 
calculations, yeah, and you get something that nicely resembles uh, what we see uh, in the experiment and much better fits uh, compared to this dash line, which would only be the SVF scale. And so this kind of demonstrates that you can use this density shift to kind of um, uh, um, yeah, probe these, these details on the, on the scattering properties between the electron and the neutral, uh, for example, here, uh, to really probe this, this P wave shape resonance. Okay, but now we want to do something uh, useful with it, so to say. Uh, I mean, this is all uh, great to understand the details of, of, the, of the scattering physics, but now we would really like to use it as a tool. And uh, the idea that, uh, that uh, we want to implement in the lab, and I also have to be sorry for this picture, I don't know how it happened, but there are some colors missing. Yeah? But um, so what we, what we want to do now is to, we want to use this single ripper impurity in a BEC to let it interact with these thousands of atoms within the ripper orbit um, and use this interaction to imprint uh, the wave function of the ripper electron onto the BEC density. And we calculate this uh, by uh, kind of in a mean field picture yeah, by um, plugging the, uh, this born Oppenheimer potential into a um, Kospitajewski equation and then just to um, uh, evolve this Kospitajewski equation in time uh, with this Rydberg atom being present uh, in the DC. Yeah? And, uh, and the, we do the simplest approximation for S states. Yeah? We use just the, the Fermi contact potential with um, a non like just a, a zero energy scattering length. And, uh, and uh, the Rydberg uh, electron density for this. Yeah? Um, and the setup we have in mind, or the, the setup that we have implemented in the lab, is, is supposed to be illustrated here. Yeah? So we have our Rydberg electron now inside the BEC, and one can really hardly see it, but this is supposed to be a lens. Yeah? So we have a high numerical aperture lens that sits just uh, about a centimeter um, above the BEC and that uh, can image the BEC with a sub-micrometer resolution and this should be for the Rydberg states we are working with which is around 140, for, supposed to be 140 for this experiment uh, is, is good enough to resolve uh, at least the angular structure uh, of the Rydberg electron uh, distribution and then the image uh, using in situ phase contrast imaging we image the condensate with this uh, um, high uh, high aperture and numerical aperture lens and what we expect to see is that then the condensate would have <coughs> an imprint of the, of the electron density or electron distribution. <coughs> and uh, I mean we, we, we did uh, numerical simulations for this uh, to, uh, to know that we are looking in the right parameter regime. Yeah? So th this, is a, uh, this is a video that I'm going to uh, play in a second. Yeah? So, that's the example of 104D Rydberg state. Uh, that's the integrated electron density along the, um, the, the line of sight that we have in the experiment. And this is what one would expect to see on the BEC happening after this Rydberg atom is present for around um, uh, 10 microseconds before, before it, let's say, decay. Yeah? We, we heard about how this decay happens in the BEC, yeah? but let's assume it's there for, for about 10 microseconds and then see how the distribution of the BC density evolves after this imprint. And I hope the video works. Yeah, and you see that uh, you get a density, uh, so that's the integrate column density um, on the BC. That's um, uh, the spatial extent here is 10 micrometers. So that's what we have to be able to resolve in the experiment. I can run it another time. Yeah, then you see that after. Uh, after a certain time, after this imprint happens, you really have a density distribution on the BEC that pretty much resembles what you would expect from this uh, Rupert D state. Yeah? So you just have to wait and kind of do this imprint and then stop the experiment in the right time. Let's say, oops, I was too fast. Stop it at the right time and then you would have this imprint of the of D state. Yeah? But this brings me now to the people that are working on this. So that, that's future um, future work that we want to do. Yeah? That was the outlook. So <coughs> But the experiment that I've shown you are, uh, are done in Tillman Faust group. Uh, that's the new team on, the, on this Rupert experiment. It has changed quite a lot during the cu last couple of months. Uh, and the, the experiments for this uh, spin orbit coupling uh, in these, these trial byte states have been mainly done by Katrin Kleinbach uh, here in the picture. And I would like to acknowledge uh, 
long-term co collaborations with uh, Chris Green and Chris Hoos uh, for, for, uh, for many different projects, and in particular this, uh, this idea of this uh, uh, coupling, uh, spin-orbit coupling in these Rydberg trilobite molecules came uh, from Georg Reitel, with whom we collaborated on this project a lot. Um, with this, I would like to thank you very much for your attention, and uh, we, uh, I will just leave a last slide. Uh, um, if you know people that are interested in doing PhD or postdocs in the Rydberg Atoms and BEC, uh, and also other projects that we do in our group, like bipolar quantum gases, hot Rydbergs in microscopy, <coughs> now, now also a new project on laser cooling of molecules, uh, we are looking for people. Yeah? Thank you very much. Thank you. Did you actually observe this in brief? Or, uh, no, ah, uh, that, that's the outlook. Yeah? We want to use okay. now this interaction to do this. Yeah? Yeah. But you simulated your numerical virtual lens. So that's exactly, yeah. So in this simulation uh, shown, this here, yeah. So there's like that, everything is included there that would limit us in the experiment. Yeah? So um, I stop here at the right moment. Let's say this would be the point at where we take the snapshot. Yeah? Uh, then what we have included there is the optical resolution of our imaging system, the integration along the line of sight in the experiment. Uh, so this is really like kind of the picture that we would, we would expect to see under our microscope. Well, just for the, what is the wavelength of your observation? And how do you know you have just one? You will probably have Poisson distribution. Ah, so, I mean, we, what we have is that, OK. We use the same lens to focus, first of all, focus our Rydberg excitation laser. Oh. Yeah. So we create the Rydberg atom always at the same spot, and the focus is also as good as our optical resolution, almost. Yeah? So it's around a micrometer, maybe below a little bit. Yeah? Um, so we can be sure where we create the Rydberg atom, and then we use the, the large blocade volume uh, oh, to have only a single one yeah. always present. Yeah? Now, do you have to do the experiment? Yes, yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> so, so we are right now doing trying this. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there should be many atoms uh, in the pure one over r to the four potential, uh, close to the to the rubidium plus, yes. right? Could they lead to some ah. decay processes or find a lifetime of these? Uh, yes, that's 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 the lifetime is an important issue, yeah, because you need time. I mean, we do this in a kind of fashion that we want, we create the ripper, or we, we plan, I should say, we plan to do this in a way that we create the ripper atom, then we wait for a certain time to uh, imp, and then this, this, this interaction will imprint a phase onto the BEC, and then this time there is actually the, uh, the evolution time after this phase imprint has happened. Yeah, so this is much longer, this is around, yeah. 160. 160 microseconds. Yeah, this phase imprint is shorter, and that can be on the order of 10 microseconds. And this 10 microseconds is about the lifetime of the Rydberg atom in this density region. Of the Other questions? But if it would be time, we look at this. And so this should not happen, yeah, because the blockade volume is much larger than our excitation volume. So we, 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 and we know this from also from our ion signals that we typically have only a single Rydberg electron, uh, Rydberg atom present in the piece. Yeah. And an important issue is that it's always at the, at the right spot. Right? So the focusing is, is important. Questions to join me. Thank you, Florian.